can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Will Nitza of IQ Bars. They do more than just bars, of course, which we'll go into. And Will, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast. And, you know, I find, you know, Will, from my research, you have some counterintuitive views, which I love, um, about conferences, um, about um, endorsing and getting uh, celebrities uh, I did an interview with Natural Stacks, um, and it was it was probably it was fun because probably the best opening of any interview I've done, not because of me, but because um, part of their company was featured on ESPN. So I just encourage people check out just the first five minutes of that. They actually did have someone that endorsed their product, and it was it was interesting to see that journey. Uh, the founder of Big League Chew uh, that was another interesting one. Um, how he's sold millions and millions of packages of shredded gum and how it started. That was another good one. And the Smart Suites founder, Tara Bosch. Um, it's funny, after I interviewed her, I was watching with my kids, Will, uh, a Megan Trainer video made you look. And sure enough, their product is in the video. And I, I think when I asked them, I don't think they paid for that placement. I think she just liked the snack and it showed up in the video, which is kind of cool. So we'll talk about some of the where IQ bars have showed up in the wild a little bit too. Uh, and this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. How do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the full strategy, accountability, and the full ex execution. Uh, will we call ourselves kind of the magic elves that work in the background to make it look easy for the host and the company? You know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire on this planet and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com. You can email us at support at rise25.com. And I'm excited to introduce Will and uh, IQ Bars. Actually, a uh, shout out to Sanjay Patel. Um, Sanjay's in my EO group in Chicago. Uh, we do meetings. And I think I sent you a picture, Will, of this. We have, in the start of the meeting, we had like six boxes of the different flavors of IQ Bars. And he's like, you know, if we're going to get through this meeting, we need some, some energy. We need some brain energy and some fuel. And he loves your bars and all of us now love them too, because he brings them to the meetings. And uh, you know, Sanjay uh, runs ElevateLVAX.com. He's a master at systems. He worked in scaled businesses, cut his teeth at his IBM for almost 15 years. So when he says something, I listen. And what was cool about this, uh, Yo Will, is I'm going to just share my screen. This is what what caught my eye uh, with the bars specifically. Um, if you're looking at the screen, um, if you're watching, listening to the audio, there's a video version. You can see us versus them. And I said, you know, Sanjay, why do you like these bars? These are good. They taste amazing. Why do you love them so much? And um, if you're looking at this, this chart of total sugar and net carbs, he's like, I don't want as much sugar and net carbs. Um, I love IQ bar is the best. That's what he said, right? So if you're looking at this one gram of sugar to 15 grams of the other bars, three grams of net carbs versus 20 grams. So I'm like, okay, sold. And then obviously there's other benefits and things like that too. The fiber, uh, it's plant protein, et cetera. But um, I'm like, Sanjay, let's do this. That you get you sold me. Okay. I'm I'm a customer for life now. So Will Nitsa is the founder and CEO of IQ Bar, one of the nation's leading <clears throat> brain and body nutrition startups. And they have a selection of IQ Bar, plant proteins, IQ Mix, which are hydration sticks, IQ Joe, which is the instant coffees packed with functional compounds and much more. And um, you can find them all at IQBar.com. Will, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So this is where I like pretty much stop talking. You do the rest of the talking. But 
Um, talk about, you know, just some of the products um, of IQ Bar to start and a little of the evolution of the products. It started with, I know, the bars and then talk through the evolution of the product product line. Sure. Yeah. So the original idea was was pretty simple. It was just brain food. Like why I didn't understand why no ready to eat brain food existed, meaning just like there was this demand for brain healthy stuff, uh, you know, could be helping you grow, you know, neurogenesis, growing new neurons could help with cell membrane wall fortification could help with staving off cognitive decline, whatever. There was a, a major demand for all of these functionalities in pill and powder format, and there was not in ready-to-eat format, which I didn't really get. Um, and, you know, on the flip side of that, if you look at, let's say, just the bar aisle, it's all body-centric. So it's weight loss, um, gut microbiome-centric, uh, so prebiotic fiber, say, it's growing new muscles, so high high protein, whatever. It's it's all body, 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 and I didn't really get why there was no no brain food. So that that was it. Um, and there was no real data on is this even a good market? You know, of course, the answer might have been there is no thing like this because no one wants this. Um, right. But you know, that's of course a risk you take when doing anything um, that's even somewhat innovative. So I thought, okay, I'll do a Kickstarter and I'll see if this is something the market wants. And that was the first iteration was just brain food. And it was a very different product. It was, the packaging looked different. It was higher in sugar. Um, You know, I had no idea how to make a product for starters, um, let alone a food product. Had no one, no one in my family, no one I knew was in food or Bev or consumer goods. And so I just sort of figured it out as I, as I went. Uh, But we made, so we pre-sold about ninety thousand dollars of product across Kickstarter and Indiegogo, just in a crowdfunding campaign, which was a massive success for us. We were trying to hit fifty thousand; would have been a massive success, and we we hit ninety thousand. So we were like, okay, this is at least something people are intrigued by, and and then we actually, I actually had to figure out how to make it right because we sold all those units without even having a product. And then we made the first iteration and then just started getting feedback on it and iterated from there. But where it shifted was after we got a bunch of feedback, basically we realized there was an opportunity to reduce sugar and net carbs and increase protein. So basically shift it from being like brain food that's low-ish sugar to ultra low sugar, low net carb, brain and body food. And the and body is kind of a key uh, like micro pivot there because just we realize like anything where it can mean and and not an or, you should do it. So it was like, can we incorporate, let's say 12 grams of plant protein and all these other things without taking away from these other things? The answer is yes. Great, let's do that. And that opened us up to a much, much broader you know, uh, total addressable market of people who, let's say, just want a, a protein bar. So now there's what's what the product evolved into what it is today is it's a unique set of value propositions such that we can hook consumers in a bunch of different ways. So you might just want a low sugar bar, right? And then you can be a customer. You might want a brain healthy bar. Great. You're a customer for that reason. You might want just a plant protein bar. You don't want an animal, you know, whey protein based bar, maybe whey upsets your stomach, whatever. Great. We can hook you that way. So there's so many ways to, to hook consumers in and the brain angle, it's, it's, it's maybe counterintuitive because our name is IQ bar. It's not the first, like in the hierarchy of value propositions, propositions, it's not number one. It's like number five. It's sort of the rounding element. That's like, it's this, this, and this plus that. And that order of operations is really critical because if you start with that, you kind of lose the consumer. Um, You like over science the consumer uh, in colloquial terms. So um, we've just found like what you emphasize and order of operations of call outs and and value propositions is incredibly important. But yeah, that's kind of how the 
the bar evolved and happy to get into the other product lines too. Yeah, I mean, the case in point, <clears throat> Will, that's, I mean, that's kind of what you have all these benefits, right? And some people gravitate, gravitate to a certain benefits uh, more than others, like Sanjay gravitated towards the, like you were saying, the net carbs and sugar, right? Now, obviously it's an additional benefit. It's got brain nutrients. It's got the protein. What were the, you know, initially, you know, when you pre-sold 90,000 and kickstarted and then the real work begins, right? You start making the bar. What were some of the things when you were thinking originally this, we want to include brain nutrients. What, what were some of the things you wanted to make sure were, were in the bar? I took a very, I literally made an Excel spreadsheet and I was like, all right, what are just the compounds that have the most scientific backing that they're good for your brain? Like, let's just list all of them. And so it was a ton of stuff. It was curcumin, you know, extract from turmeric, uh, resveratrol, extract from grapes, vitamin E, flavonoids, which is a, a polyphenol. Um, you know, MCTs were really hot at that time, medium chain triglycerides, because it was an alternate fuel source for the brain that was really interesting um and so you know omega-3s that that's one that everyone would recognize so um basically i just laid that out and i was like okay how like what are whole food ingredients that are highest in all of these things so then you know i had a two by two i had like one axis was all these compounds that had had a ton of clinical data behind it. And then on the other axis, you had all the whole food ingredients that's richest in these things. And so like for, you know, vitamin E, let's say it would be, you know, almonds are very high in, in vitamin E. Sunflower seeds are very high in vitamin E. For flavonoids, you know, blueberries, incredibly high in flavonoids um, in the berry family. Matcha in the leaf family, very high in flavonoids. Uh, the cocoa bean very high in five nights. So, and then of course, and then the question is, okay, can I make a product out of all of these things? Um, and I yeah, was a blueberry super... matcha, <laughs> like blueberry matcha almond, you know, at some point you got, you got the, well, like, I kind of wanted to, I kind of wanted to take one. So I wanted to have each of them represented. So like for five nights, for example, I could have a blueberry bar and then separately I could have a matcha bar. And so I'm hitting on that nutrient in this way over here and in that way over there. Same thing for, you know, um, you know, uh, other like magnesium or vitamin E or whatever. Um, you can get it from different sources. So I it was super naive, though, to start. So I, I wanted I was obsessed with curcumin at the time and and resveratrol. But um what what you learn pretty early on is okay you you just can't you start it's like science meets commercialization um and consumer trends and consumer habits and consumer desires and market structures and so for example you can't have an orange bar it's going to stain people's <laughs> fingers orange right and it just doesn't look yeah. good doesn't taste good and it's super expensive so like that's just not going to work. Uh, maybe that works in some like smoothie and whole foods or whatever. It's not going to work in a mass market bar. Okay. That's not going to work. Resveratrol, it's just plain too expensive. It's actually fairly, you know, it's like white, odorless, tasteless, et cetera. Great. But it's just not expensive. No one, A, no one knows who it, what it is. B, no one's willing to pay 10 bucks for a bar. And C, like supply chain is probably a nightmare. So you, you just start early on, like, how, like realizing these um realities that you, your reality start clashing with your theoreticals and um and then yeah you just sort of zero in on what what's feasible and what's doable and then again like so there's two paths you can take you can take like the ultra premium route which is like okay i want to sell this on like goop.com or whatever and like whole foods and I want to sell on a high, it's, it's going to be a premium product. I want to sell on high end distribution channels. And like, that's who I'm going to be. And I'm going to cater to the person who really nerds out on this stuff and is willing to pay. That's like one path. And then the other path is I want to be everywhere. 
I want to be sold. I want to distribute as widely and extensively as possible. I want to be in Costco. I want to be in Walmart. I want to be in Amazon, et cetera. And those are just dramatically different paths. Everything you do is different based on which of those paths you you pick. And I wanted to be, I wanted the second path. So <clears throat> you, know, you have to get to certain price points, which means you have like, there's just so many ways you have to engineer your company, product line, et cetera, to be able to truly democratize the product. And um, I think we've done a, a decent job at that. You know, I'm looking at the screen. If you're watching this, you know, there's some amazing flavors, beautiful packaging. Tell me about the first version. What was the flavor? What did it look like? You said it looked a lot different in the beginning. I mean, for one, so basically the way you, you, uh, I don't know how other people do it. This is how our process evolved. Basically you find a co-packer, a contract manufacturer who will make your thing and you have no leverage over them. You also, if you're me, you have no knowledge of the space, food formulation, any of that. And so the first co-packer I went to, there was a woman named Liz and she made products like she was a formulator in addition to being an owner of of the manufacturing setup and so i was like hey i want to do this 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 and this can you help me and she's like yep here's like a block of consulting hours and i can make it and i was like well can i be there with you in the the lab making it and she's like sure and so basically we did it together me just like watching her do it and i again i was super naive at that point but um so I didn't know what I didn't know, and I didn't know where to push back and yada, yada. But And the first products were great. Um, it just was, it would have never been commercially feasible because um, it wouldn't have, the shelf life wouldn't have been long enough, you know, because or she's using certain coconut that would go rancid after six months, and we need this thing to last 12 months. Like, as a random example, that the ingredients, certain ingredients were just, too expensive because the supplier was just an expensive supplier and you can get the same quality product for half the price. And so there's just all these things where it was like the bar spits out and it's whatever it is, buck 25 in, co in cost of goods. And to be really, you know, mass market, you, ne you need that to be literally half. So it's just, yeah. I mean, but at that point you're just, you know, you're in you're in idea validation stage, and um, is there a product market fit here, or a semblance of it, or a path to it? And we checked that binary box, and then it was just like, all right, now how do we make this a, like a viable business? How many flavors did you launch with from the Kickstarter? Three, three. But there were that was another good lesson. Like they were super esoteric flavors it was uh let's see if i can remember it was blueberry sunflower walnut matcha chai hazelnut and cacao almond sea salt so like for example we that was a very intentional naming convention so cacao instead of chocolate right it's that's very intentional you're going after a certain crowd most people don't know what cacao is and then you know look now chocolate sea salt right right down yeah. the fairway so um basically what you learn is and this is i think i think a mistake a lot of people make is that they build products for either themselves or like the perfect consumer quote unquote um and then they realize oh crap there's just not that many of those people or i'm going to hit a ceiling really quickly and if I did this over here, I could still get that person, by the way, and get all these other people. And so anyway, that goes all the way down to that, you know, flavor titling. I'm curious, well, at the time when you did the six hour, what was life like? Were you working a job? Were you in between jobs? What, what did your, per, you know, your personal and business life look like at that time? Oh, I mean, it was, so I was... I had a girlfriend, but I had no kids, no debt, no, uh, I had nothing like the walls were not caving in in any meaningful way such that, frankly, I don't, 
everyone talks about, oh, it's such a big risk to start a company. At that point in my life, I was 25, 26. I didn't even view it as that big of a, of a risk. I just viewed it as something like I was going to start a company. If ever there was a point in my life, that was the point. And I just need to figure out how to survive while I start this. Like riskiness was never in the equation for me because what's the worst that happens? You fail and then you just go get the same job or a better job because frankly, people are in like startups are cool now and you took the initiative to do this thing and that's valuable to people now. And so, um, but how I did it was I walked into my boss's office one day and I said, uh, I look, I know you, I know that you know that I want to start my own thing at some point. Now is kind of the time. Here's what I would propose. Cut my salary in half, cut my hours in half. And, uh, and then I'll help you find someone new to replace me. And luckily at that point, I had a, I was good at my job. I had developed enough skills and it was pretty hard to replace me. And so I knew I had some leverage there. I knew I could buy myself six months time. I mean, of course you could say, you know, pack your bags and get out, but I was pretty sure he wouldn't say that. And so I said, are you, are you open to this arrangement? He said, give me a day. And then a day later he said, yes. So that allowed me to where I was only working 20 hours a week, but I was making enough to survive. And then I could work a full-time job. You can work hundred hours on top of that. And so it was like the perfect arrangement. Um, and I did that for a year and then did the Kickstarter. And then I was still making $0. So even after that, I moved into a friend's parents basement, um, and did that for a year. So I was, it's like super unglamorous. Um, you know, it was a rough couple of years. And by the way, I was a one man band. Like there was no, there is no co-founder. I tried to find people to start it with me. It was, it's kind of a hard sell, like a protein bar startup is just not like a, that's not a sexy enterprise for most people. They're not, they're not going to quit their job at, you know, Boston Consulting Group and 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 take a flyer on you. Um, so, and of course, like that's a bl blessing in disguise in retrospect. Um, I, I, I'm actually firmly in the solo founder camp for, um, you know, having done it that way. So it was chaotic, uh, but it was fun. It was like, I was working way more than I was before, but I was, it was, there was something really invigorating at, about doing your own thing you know i love hearing the non-glamorous stories because you know we see oh like will's made it he's got this we don't see the sleeping on the couch in the friend's basement you know scene um you know what were you doing for that year you said that year you were part-time and before you launched the kickstarter what were you preparing and working on in that year before you launched the kickstarter up until that point yeah I mean, knowing what I know now, I could I could shave that down to like three, four months. I just didn't know anything, right? So it's not just, this is the crazy thing about being an entrepreneur. You have to be an amateur accountant. You have to be an amateur lawyer. You have to be an amateur trademark specialist. You have to be an amateur food scientist if you're doing food. You have to be an amateur website builder. You have to be an amateur brander. You have to be an amateur marketer. You have to be an amateur social media marketer. It's like... You actually have to become somewhat proficient in like 30 things. And if you don't, and by the way, I was coming from B2B software sales, which was relevant to none of that. So I was starting at true zero on everything. And so it's just, it's just a lot. It's just a steep learning curve when you aggregate all that together. That was a year of just like figuring that out. Like, do I incorporate as an LLC or a C corp? Well, there's these reasons to LLC, these reasons to do C corp. You know, okay, I'm going to do C corp for this reason. Great. Like, now I got to file all this paperwork. And um, so it's just each one of those nodes I had to like figure out and just put one foot in front of the other until finally at the end of the year, I was like, okay, I have a name. I filed for the trademark. I've incorporated the company. I have a functioning website, like blah, 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 blah. And um, it just takes a lot of time if you're one guy who knows zero. 
Yeah. Talk, I want to talk about growth and profitability, right? Um, because like you said, at that point, even when people are selling, um, let's talk about the profitability point for a second. You know, I know lots of, and you do too, the more you sell, the more you need in inventory. So how do you manage the eventually, okay, at some point, I just need to work on this full time. I can't even spend, you know, as you get busier and busier, you can't afford to spend the 20 hours working this other job because there's a huge trajectory of growth for IQ bar. How do you manage that piece when I think you'll tell me e-commerce um, and, and CPG seems really difficult because you have to keep reinvesting. Yeah. Yeah, so that's like a fundraise. That's like a that's a twofer. That's a fundraising and profitability one, which is good. Um, so I'm firmly in the camp that you should raise money for consumer goods, specifically outside of let's say eighty percent plus gross margin products. So like beauty products, jewelry, things like that. I think you can swing it without raising money. Everything else. It is technically possible, but I would say highly unadvisable to not raise money. Of course, then the question is, can you raise money in as a non-dilutive way possible, which was always my goal. But I knew I needed to raise some money. To your point, you need to manufacture real things that cost real money. And by the way, your margin is going to be terrible to start. It just is. Your volume is going to be really low. You're not going to know what dials to twist to get suppliers to give you better pricing, blah, blah, blah. So it's just going to be not profitable. And, you know, God forbid, <clears throat> God forbid you need to make a salary and feed yourself and all that, right? So it's just, you just need money. So the way I looked at that was up front was basically, okay, I'm going to raise, call it just enough money to run a really good Kickstarter. This is a maybe a non-intuitive thing. Really, you want to have something like 10, 20, 30, 40 grand to run a really good Kickstarter. And then maybe another non-intuitive thing is that the goal of Kickstarter is not to get money to make product to start your business. It's to do all that, but mostly to validate an idea such that you can then raise money on that idea in a way that de is de-risk for investors. So the, the people don't really view, like that is the true way, I, in my opinion, to best leverage a tool like Kickstarter. People don't think of it that way. But so that was always the plan. Raised, I raised, I think it was 30K from a random now board member and good friend, but at the time, random guy I got connected into, a uh, really successful guy in the agriculture, agriculture space. And he gave me 10K. That's just like a flyer. Um, and then his buddy gave me 10K. And then I got a third person to give me 10K. I was like, cool, I have 30K. Ran the Kickstarter. That was a success. I turned her back around to them. I was like, all right, I, I want to raise half a million bucks. And we just had, you know, in our first two months, we sold 90K of product. And they got all excited about it because we had that proof point. We weren't just coming to them with a PowerPoint deck. We were coming to them with sales. And so then that first guy wrote a $200,000 check. And then the second guy wrote a $200,000 check. And then the incremental, we actually ended up raising, I think it was like 625. That incremental 225 was easy at that point. And so, yeah, we just needed money. And then as our whole goal has been to scale fast, I mean, the definition of a startup is a fast growing, ultra fast growing nascent business. You're not really a startup not growing fast um it's the whole point of of the of the enterprise so um we've always tried to grow 100 percent or at least 75 percent every year and that just at a certain growth rate in cpg in certain categories you're just gonna have to keep raising money and so again the question is just how do you make it as non-dilutive as possible and so yeah over the course of years we've raised actually now 10 million, I believe we've raised almost exactly 10 million at this point, but still control more than half of the company. Um, because we've kept showing really good results, justifying great valuations and raising as little money as possible to get us to the next tier. 
but uh, to your point, profitability at some point, you not, you have to flip the switch and be a self-sustaining entity. At some point you have to live off what you, you know, what you kill, so to speak. So, um, that is like now this year is our first profitable year. Um, but we didn't get there until we got to like over 25 million in annual sales. Didn't get to, to meaningful profitability. So profitability is just tough in, I think in the CPG industry, because like you have to keep fulfilling orders as you sell more. Right. So it's, I, I think it's really difficult because you're always having to pour money back into the inventory to sell more. Right. Totally. Well, that, yeah. So there's two like concerns. There's profitability and then cash flow. To your point, that that's a cash flow concern. And yes, that that is like you live and die by your cash flow. It doesn't, you could actually be profitable and have terrible cash flow and go out of business. Meaning just what you said. You you have to spend money before you get money back. And that delta keeps growing and growing and growing because you have more and more demand. So yes, that is those are two things you have to be juggling there are some there are some creative ways that you can bridge that gap today that didn't exist say 10 15 years ago there are ways to finance like for example we had a giant sam's club po and we had to borrow a million dollars we didn't have the money literally to make the product to fulfill the order so we had to borrow a million dollars but you know luckily if you have good po's from reputable retailers you know that lender knows that Walmart is going to pay that PO. Um, costs you a little bit of money to finance it, but you can bridge that gap. Um, but yeah, you have to. So I add that to your list of hats you have to wear. You have to be a, a financial engineer as well um, to, to get by, unless you just raise just a boatload of money, right? And then, and then you don't have to do any of it because you just you have so much padding, but now you just sold most of your company. So yeah, the, but the also like the the market has shifted, right? So there there used to be this dynamic where growth at all costs was rewarded. The inverse of that is became true in Q1 of 2022. It was it was kind of stark the shift, and um, tech, of course, got got whacked the hardest, but CPG got whacked pretty hard too. And all these brands that their DNA was built on growth, 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 and it's okay to lose. $5 million a year overnight that became eminently not okay to lose $5 million a year. And so that's really hard to change your fundamental DNA really hard in, you know, in some cases near impossible. Um, fortunately we had always built into our DNA that that path to profitability. And, um, so we, we were all right. And, I can get into how, you know, what are the levers we pull to be profitable, but net net, that's just that yeah. is the normal that we're in. It's not an easy journey. Um, I want to talk about the growth. Um, because there's channel growth, there's also product growth. Um, talk about what you did um from a growth perspective. We were omni-channel from a pretty early stage. Um, we so we uh, created a website after the Kickstarter. We layered on Amazon after that. Amazon very quickly started outpacing mm. like four or five to one our website, and so we very quickly realized the power of Amazon. And by the way, keto at the time was exploding, and we were a beneficiary of that in the early days. It's now sort of tapered off, but yeah. um, people still look. I mean, on your packaging, paleo is was and is big in certain, especially in certain groups in keto. Yep. Yeah. So, but it's just the number of people. I had Lauren switching. Cordain on uh, the 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 show. Um, who I don't know. His book is the the paleo diet, literally. So. Um, I think it's still big, still certain groups. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was paleo and paleo is still big, but then keto kind of like surpassed it. And then can then keto plateau. It's like, there's like boom and bust cycles for every, every diet. Um, but they're always going to be that big, still big loyal following of, of those diets. So yeah, well, our biggest growth sort of like inflection point was just keto intersecting with Amazon and just 
a zillion people searching for keto products on Amazon. We happen to have a keto compliant bar and it was it was kind of wild. You were just selling 20K a month, then 40K a month, then 80K a month, then 100K a month, you know. Um, so that, and still today, Amazon's our biggest sales channel. But um, but then pretty quickly, we, we thought like, okay, we should, we want to be omni-channel. We want to start diversifying as early as possible. We don't want to just be an Amazon. It's just so risky to be an Amazon-only brand or a D2C-only brand. And so we went into actually CVS was our first retailer, and that was not great. Uh, learned a lot of lessons. You there. Just, thrilled about that. <laughs> what, yeah. What? How did you get into CVS? Well, they're local ish. Uh, they're I'm in Boston, and then they're in Providence, so like 45 minutes away. And then yeah, I just knew a guy who had gotten in, and then I got a contact number, and I called it. And it was a guy who was a category manager for this new set that was like functional foods and supplements and pitched him and we did a pilot and did well in the pilot and then went into 3000 stores. So that was, that was a wild moment. Cause we, that took us from doing, from manufacturing like 20,000 bars a clip to like 200,000 bars a clip. Um, we had to change manufacturers it, it was wild. It was a really wild couple months, very stressful, but we did it. And ultimately we, we don't sell on CBS anymore. It, it wasn't really a great fit for us. Uh, like the set really was the main issue it was kind of in the back corner and it's just, you Were know, you you replaced. A, yeah. And we weren't in the bar set and we were in like a brain set. And so anyway, it didn't work out, but that was our first like foray. And then we, and then we got into Kroger and then we got into Wegmans and then we got into Sprouts and then we got into, you know, Walmart and all, all these other retailers and and really substantially diversified the the business such that now today, you know, it's it's basically 50-50 e-commerce and brick and mortar. Um, but we did that, I think, earlier than other brands would have. And I'm I'm glad we did. Not not because we're geniuses or anything. We just Honestly, we just wanted more revenue. <laughs> uh, but in retrospect, the diversification benefits were just were just giant. So how do you, you know, your question was on on growth, like growth, it's just you're growing within channels, but we're always trying to sell, like add new distribution. Um, and it's just such a big pie, like even just even in America alone, forget international. There's just so many people that buy in so many channels that it, it's almost endless. Are there any channels now that you um, you haven't gotten into yet, but you it's kind of on the roadmap? Yeah, I'm very interested in. So we we sell, have a hydration product called IQ Mix, which is think like liquid IV minus sugar plus brain nutrients would be like the quick pitch. Um, and I think it would do really, really well in field-based, uh, like oil field, you know, oil field services, mining, wireless carriers, construction, um, like anything with a field-based team where you're out in the heat, you need hydration. Like you just need it. And you need many, like several servings a day. I really want to break into that market uh, for hydration and coffee. Um, so we have a coffee product called IQ Joe, which is like an enhanced on the go instant coffee. No one really talks about those channels, by the way. They're like they're, you'll never see them on pitch decks. No, no one's posting about them, and yet they're gigantic. Mm. Um, you know the amount of volume that flows through. Like think like FEMA, right? There's a hurricane in whatever Florida. All the people in that in the field need to be hydrating. It's like thousands and thousands and thousands of servings needed. Um, so it's just there's all these places where you're, I think our products could do a lot of good, and we could, you know, realize meaningful sales that are just not conventionally talked about like this. So where would people? have those like when you say that it makes me think of the uh 
the National Convenience Store Trade Show, NAX, uh, for some reason. And, um, you know, I picture like truckers going into a gas station, getting like an energy drink or something like that, right? Where would the, that this IQ Mix product be for those individuals so they can grab it? Well, there, there are a couple like really big distributors. So like Granger and Fast and all. And, and then, you know, Staples distributes to like offices and mm. WB, WB Mason locally in New England. And um they're typically everything runs through distributors mm -hmm. so you can cut deals directly right with um whatever fedex let's say could do an rfp for hydration products and you could just go direct with fedex um and then they're distributing it to their own field tax let's say so it it, it, it depends but generally speaking it's running through a distributor yeah yeah, I remember my my sister worked for Salesforce. Um, you know, they had stocked. I had um, the the founder of Hint Water on, and they stocked Hint Water. So she, I mean, she knew about I think more about Hint Water before a lot of people. Like it hit the mainstream because, like you said, it went into you know Salesforce's offices, and she knew about it, and and they had it there for them. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on distributors and i know you have certain thoughts on conferences that i think are or trade shows that are a little bit counterintuitive thoughts and distribute well i don't have a ton of thoughts on distributors um other than they're necessary and uh and we have great relationships with all our distributors but on the on the trade show side i mean that's my thoughts there are kind of part of a broader just general philosophy, which is revenue, uh, energy and revenue out is, is really the ratio that, in my opinion, any CPG founder, I, I would assume any founder should really be thinking about at least in the first five years of your business. And, and to forget for the most part about aesthetics. And the thing about trade shows, at least in food and bev is you're off there, you're often doing it because other people are doing it. You're going to show. There's a FOMO, right? Yeah, there's a FOMO, and then also you're you're almost like going to show other startups that you're there and you're real and you're someone to be considered, which is so funny because that's not your customer. Um, and and there's an opportunity cost to everything, as well as a real financial cost. And so when you look at something like a trade show or Expo West or whatever, getting a booth and flying a bunch of people out there and, you know, spending money on hotels and dinners and the fee to do the show in the first place and blah, blah, blah. And like the months of prep beforehand, what is the, what's the energy in and, and dollars in and, and what's the actual revenue out? And, and one common, I think, mistake I see a lot of people make is like, oh, well, we got this big deal out of it. And so it was all worth it. To which I would say, but but you have to like A-B test that against, could you have gotten that deal plus other deals, you know, by just doing none of that and just cold calling or emailing or hiring a broker, or whatever. There's so many other ways to spend your time and energy to get that business and more. It's just generally speaking, in my experience, is a terrible return on investment, um, all things considered. And people think it isn't because they got some outcome out of it and they don't realize it could have gotten net net better aggregate outcomes had they diverted all that time and energy elsewhere. So it's a bit counterintuitive because it's um, we've only been to one trade show ever. Um, and yeah, our thought was kind of like, do you go as an attendee or not at all? Uh, we got one booth at one show. Uh, and then no, I've never just gone as an attendee. That that is not a bad move, uh, no question. Like just go and walk the show, and but again, you know, I don't know. You're flying, you're spending the time. Um, I always think just like could this have been a Google search slash three phone calls to get that same information? If yes, don't don't do it. Don't fly. Well, I guess the one exception would be like in-person 
is meaningful. Um, it is meaningful to shake someone's hand and get FaceTime. And so if there are certain people that you're meeting with and that's the place to meet with them, then okay, that's like separate. Um, but I always try to meet with people on their own turf anyway. So that is a that is one caveat or one exce like exception is like if if there are just in person meetings that will change the game with X Y Z retailer and you really can't get to that retailer in some other way. Fair enough. Yeah. Um. I, I have one last question. Well, before I ask it, I want to point people to iqbar.com. You can just go to eatiqbar.com. You can check out the IQ bars, the IQ mix, the IQ Joe, and everything else they have on there. And you can check them out on Amazon and possibly a local grocery store. Well, last question is, I, you know, I know you geek out on the science stuff and some of the, the health related stuff. Who are some of your favorites that you follow what they're talking about? I know before we hit record, we were talking about uh, Andrew Huberman and who are some of the other people you follow in the health space? Yeah. Yeah. No, Huberman has obviously been incredibly successful and I love all of his content. Rhonda Patrick is, is, um, maybe my favorite she's just she rattles off clinical studies like no one i've ever uh i've ever heard which is just fun and impressive i have been reading me and the rest of uh the world has been reading outlive by peter atia so um i've been enjoying that and some of the sort of counter i don't know if it's counterintuitive or just counter to traditional advice uh he's he's given there and has made me think differently about diet and exercise so um, he's a big one. Ben Greenfield. I've always liked I've had Ben on the podcast. He's awesome. Nice. Yeah. He he's from all from everything I can tell, a great guy. Um and creates creates great content. So those are the big ones. Um I don't know. I follow a lot of random content that's like non-influencery content. I just read up uh, on a lot of different stuff. But th those would be the big ones. Yeah. Will, I want to first want to thank you. Thanks, uh, everyone. Check out eatiqbar.com, iqbar.com, and we'll see everyone next time. Thanks, Will. Thanks for having me. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, nice like a peach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.